Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you whom I don't know, I'm Professor Mara Letterman, and I'm a professor in the uh, area of strategic management in the Rotman School. Today, it's my distinct pleasure to get to introduce to you Dr. Jane McGonigal. She's the Director of Game Research and Development at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, and she holds a PhD from UC Berkeley in Performance Studies, and she flew in from San Francisco to join us today. Jane is probably best described as a visionary and uh, a visionary game designer and a futurist. She's harnessing the power of video games in new ways and trying to use these games to help solve some of the world's biggest problems. Um, as you may have heard or, or read, one of, the, one of the biggest games she's worked on is this game called World Without Oil, which is a six-week collaborative simulation of what would happen in the event of an oil shortage. Uh, her work has become very well known. It's been featured in The Economist, on CNN, MTV, NPR, uh, Wired Magazine, Psychology Today, um, and she's increasingly uh, advising companies uh, that we all know about, such as Microsoft and McDonald's, Intel, Disney, Mattel, as well as designing games for organizations such as the World Bank and the American Heart Association. Her speech last year at TED called Games Can Make a Better World is rated as one of the all-time most engaging TED Talks. Uh, and today we have the distinct pleasure of having her talk about her new book, uh, Reality is Broken, Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World. So Jane, welcome to Rotman and thank you very much. everybody. This is very exciting. This looks like a room full of people ready to make themselves better and change the world. Is that right? Am I, am I in the right place? All right. All right. Good. Good. So that is what we're here to talk about tonight, about why reality is broken and, and what games can do to help fix that. I have to confess that if you told me five or ten years ago that I would be running around the world evangelizing for all of us to spend say, 21 billion hours a week playing video games, I would have thought that you were crazy and never could have imagined this for myself. So I thought maybe I would just start tonight by telling you a little bit about how I got to where I am, why I wrote the book, and why I am running around the world saying big, crazy things and hoping that people take me seriously. So I am the Director of Game Research and Development at the Institute for the Future, and this is the world's oldest future forecasting organization. And one of the things that we believe at the Institute for the Future is that you should not try to predict the future. Predicting the future is, first of all, impossible, which makes it a very good reason not to try to do it. But also, if you predict the future, then you're just kind of stuck preparing for whatever you predicted. And it's actually much more useful to figure out what kind of future you want and what will you have to do to make that future a reality? So if you came to visit us at IFTF, you'd see this banner hanging in our offices. And this just really sums up our point of view. Forget trying to see the future. We should try to make the future. One of the ways that we get ready to make the future is we come up with our best case scenario futures. Or I call, since I'm a gamer, I call these epic win futures. And epic wins, as you know, are scenarios that are so positive, outcomes so extraordinary, that you didn't think they were possible until you were right on the verge of achieving them. And I want that future for us. I want a future so extraordinarily positive that we had no idea it was possible until we were this close to achieving it. So this is the epic win future that I came up with a few years ago, was that I would like to see a game designer nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize by the year 2023. I, I came up with this goal in, in 2008, and it seemed that, that 15 years was a reasonable amount of time. I don't know where I came up with that number from. But so two years, three years less to go. I'm still confident we can come up with that. And it's kind of a strange idea if you're used to thinking about games as escapist, right? We play games to ignore the real world and to get away from our problems. But increasingly, scientific research is suggesting that games have an incredible impact on how we think and act in real life, and that possibly they could be changing what we're capable of. So that's what I wanted to write my book about. I'll look at all the different ways the games are changing who we really are and what we're really capable of, and then try to figure out if we could put that to good use. So that's what's inside the book. I know you all got the book, so that's good. So when you get home, you'll be able to flip through it and find 14 ways 
that games can help us do something to make the world better. But I want to let you know, before you dive into the book, that this is not just a book about computer games or video games. Humans have been playing games for thousands of years. And in fact, the first written history of people getting addicted to games, of being so immersed in gameplay that they forgot to eat, was written thousands of years ago. So this is not new to World of Warcraft. This is something that has always been true about games. And so I wanted to find out what is it about games as an organizational structure, not as a technology, but as a way of organizing people to spend time and attention on a particular goal. What is that about games that somehow motivates us and immerses us so much? So let's, let's take a minute and ask ourselves, what is it that makes a game? How do we know when we're playing a game? It's not little beeps and boops. It's not a virtual gun to shoot at something. It's not dice or a board. There's something intrinsic at the heart of all games that lets us know we're playing a game. And this is the best definition that I've come up with. I didn't actually come up with this. Actually, it was a Canadian who came up with this. Um, the, the late professor, Bernard Suits, a, a former uh, philosophy professor, he said that games are unnecessary obstacles that we volunteer to tackle. So what does this mean? Well, I'll say it again. We'll let it sink in. Because I want you to remember this. This is a very useful definition. Games are unnecessary obstacles that we volunteer to tackle. So let's use a non-digital game to explore this definition. Let's take golf. In golf, you have a goal. What's your goal in golf? Your goal is to get a very small ball in a very small hole. Now, if this were not a game, if this were the real world, what would you do to achieve the goal of getting a ball in a hole? You would pick up the ball, you would walk over <laughs> to the hole, and you would put it in the hole, and you would be like, yes, I did it. But for some reason, because golf is a game, we agree to stand really far away from the hole and use a big stick to hit the ball in the direction of the hole. Why do we do this? We do this because we crave unnecessary obstacles. We crave a challenge that provokes our curiosity about what we're capable of. Can I do this? We crave a challenge that provokes creativity about how we're going to solve the problem. We put all these strange rules in the way of achieving the goal so that we're forced to try a different strategy. We like having these goals that pressure, put pressure on ourselves to perform at a higher capacity, right? And so we will do crazy things. We put sand traps in to make it harder when we've gotten good at hitting the ball with a stick. We, we, make, we make incredibly difficult courses and continue to make the goal harder and harder the more we play the game. So when you think about it, playing games is actually very hard work, right? It's just a very special kind of hard work. It's hard work that we choose for ourselves, okay? Now, if you look at popular computer games and video games today, how many people play Angry Birds? Yeah, okay, good, right. <laughs> so Angry Birds is a perfect example. When do you play Angry Birds? You play Angry Birds when you have a few minutes here or there, you're a little bit bored, there's a little bit of downtime, you pull it out. Now, this is completely unnecessary work. Who said you had to avenge these birds for the pigs that stole their eggs and you had to knock down their houses and using incredibly increasingly difficult strategies of hurling the birds at the houses. This is not your job. This, the birds should worry about this. But because we crave that little bit of challenge, that little bit of obstacle that provokes our motivation and our curiosity and creativity, we will take on this job even when we could just be relaxing. You think about some of the physical activity games that we play, like the new Dance Central for Connect, right? If we wanted to dance, why don't we just dance? Why don't we just put on music to dance? But instead, tons of people who would never get in front of their friends and dance in real life will get in front of their friends and dance when they're playing this game because the game puts all these unnecessary obstacles in the way. You have to move your body exactly how she's doing it, right? You've got to talk to the hand, right? So you've got to go over these unnecessary obstacles and it takes you out of yourself and it makes dancing into something that you have self-motivated yourself to do because you're curious to see if you can do it. 
Then you have games like Farmville, which, boy, you want to talk about unnecessary work. People spend enormous amounts of time tending to virtual farms when they wouldn't, for their life, plant a vegetable in their own backyard. Why is this? I, know I have to say, I played a ton of Farmville while I was writing this book. In fact, during the hardest part of writing, when I was really trying to just get all the ideas down on paper, I was playing an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening because no matter how poorly I did with my book, which writing a book, it feels like you're never getting anywhere. I mean, it just keeps, keeps more pages and more pages and no one reads it and you don't know if it's any good. But I would just know at the end of the day, I would have all these crops that I could harvest and I could feed my little puppy, and I would feel very good, and I would feel productive, right? This was work that I could choose to undertake and know with a high confidence that I would be productive and successful. Even games that we think of as, as being, you know, these really high production games that we just play for the thrill of it, for the fun, like the Call of Duty series, right? Very intense, very shooter oriented. Even these games put all kinds of unnecessary obstacles in the way of us getting our sheer thrills and pleasures, right? So Call of Duty, these games now have all of these special ops where you have to do incredibly cooperative missions, right? You can't just play by the game by yourself and have all the fun by yourself. You gotta find a friend and you have to coordinate with your friend in really complex ways in order to overcome these special ops missions, right? And this brings out a special kind of voluntary obstacle, right? You have to find an ally. You have to learn each other's strengths and work together. And that can be a very satisfying kind of work that we don't often get to do in real life. And then, of course, you have something like World of Warcraft, which we know the average World of Warcraft player spends 22 hours a week playing, so more than a half-time job. And in order to level up to what used to be the highest level, level 60, you had to put in, on average, 500 hours of work just to get to that highest level where many gamers say that's where the fun begins. Now what kind of crazy world are we in that you have to convince a player to spend 500 hours playing until they get to the fun part? Why would anybody do that? We do that because we actually crave the work. It's actually the work is the fun part. Now if you add up all of the time that we spend playing World of Warcraft, it gets to a rather staggering number. 5.93 million years that we've spent tackling the completely unnecessary obstacles in Azeroth. And just to put that in perspective, which I like, I like this fact because it really speaks to the uh, enormous scale of what's happening. 5.93 million years ago was, was exactly the point in the archaeological uh, the history of humanity that the first human ancestors stood up, the first primates went to become to, uh, up on their two feet. Now that, that's really extraordinary, but it's not just World of Warcraft, it's really all the games that we're playing. You can kind of look at these staggering numbers. So Bejeweled, we spent 3.2 million years playing. The Halo, we've got a quarter of a million years. And even Rock Band, we're up to 57,000 years so far. And I just like this picture because it just reminds us that we're talking about an enormous scale of activity, an enormous potential human resource. In fact, it's 3 billion hours a week that we're spending playing online games. There are about 500 million people who are contributing, um, on average, at least an hour a day to playing these games. Now, to put that number in perspective, Clay Shirky, who many of you may know from his books, Cognitive Surplus, or Here Comes Everybody, he worked with a researcher at IBM to calculate how long it took to create Wikipedia. The entire Wikipedia English language not just the articles, but also the code that makes Wikipedia work, all the community management, up until about a year and a half ago. How many hours had it taken from the start of Wikipedia to get the whole Wikipedia, every article, every, every bit of code? And they calculated that it had taken 100 million hours of online collaboration, okay? 100 million hours. Even if we only spent one out of every 10 hours that we were spending playing online games, playing a game that tackled a real problem, we would have the cognitive capacity to do three Wikipedias every single week. That's an incredible amount of time that we could potentially play with. But as I started to look at all these numbers, I had to ask myself, why on earth are we spending so much time tackling unnecessary obstacles? Why don't we just get another job and maybe make some money? Why don't we do something with prestige? You know, If you look at the people who spend the most time playing games, 
they all have someone in their life, a parent, a spouse, a friend, a coworker, who says, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just give it up? Why don't you come back to the real world? So there's actually a cost to spending a lot of time playing games, and yet we do it anyway. What is it? Well, as I started to think about this question, I was reminded by something that one of the earliest theorists of play, great 20th century theorists of play, Brian Sutton Smith had once said. He said that the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. And this really triggered something. You know, I have a twin sister who did her PhD in psychology at Stanford. She still teaches there. And the whole time I was in graduate school studying games, she was feeding me game research. And one of the things that we started talking about was how the clinical definition of depression is really pivotal to understanding why we play so many games. So if you look at the main two elements of depression, they are a pessimistic sense of our own capabilities and a despondent lack of energy. Now, if you were to reverse these two traits, you would get something like an invigorating rush of energy and an optimistic sense of our own capabilities. Now, there's no definition to a clinical term for that in psychology, right? But I would propose that it's a perfect definition of gameplay that when we play games, it's an opportunity to wholeheartedly engage in a difficult challenge that we believe we have a good chance of overcoming. And so it fills us with a surge of energy and it fills us with optimism. So it's really the opposite of depression. So I started to look further into the science, the research behind this, and I came upon the concept of eustress. So eustress, it turns out, is an incredibly important concept that we don't really spend a lot of time talking about. Eustress is the opposite of the normal kind of stress. When we say we have a lot of stress, we usually mean negative stress. We mean we have a boss who's getting, trying to get something done from us that we don't feel like we have enough time to do or enough resources to do and we feel under stress. Or we have a test that we're studying for and we don't have enough time and we're not sure we're gonna do well and we're under stress. Maybe our parents are just stressing us out and we just, oh, we want to, leave us alone. But there's another kind of stress, which is actually biochemically, physiologically identical to negative stress. The adrenaline gets going, our breathing rate changes, our uh, brains sharpen their focus and attention. But if we have chosen to be stressed, if we have put ourselves intentionally in a challenging situation, instead of experiencing anxiety or frustration, we experience exhilaration, self-motivation, drive, and optimism. So that's the state of eustress. And it turns out that eustress is actually an incredibly optimal human state of being. That we're, when we're in a state of eustress, we're more motivated, so we'll work harder under more difficult conditions. We'll set higher, more ambitious goals for ourselves. And we're more likely to ask other people for help and believe that they might help us. So there's a higher level of performance when we are in a state of eustress. And many, many people crave the state. We actually don't walk around in life wishing that we could relax more, right? We think we want to relax because we're so negatively stressed out. But if we had no problems, right? If we had enough money, if we had all of our necessities met, would we sit around and relax? or would we try and find something challenging to do? So research suggests that in a natural state, when all our needs are being, all our needs are being met, what we want is the challenge. We want the positive stress. We want to feel activated and engaged. And this helps explain why so many people are spending so much time playing games, because this is an optimal state of being. Now we can, I've just said a lot of words, but we can learn a lot more about the state of eustress from just looking at the faces of gamers. So this is a series of portraits taken by a, a photographer named Phil Toldano, also a fellow Canadian. I, I didn't realize that my talk was so full of great thinkers and artists uh, from here. This is good. Um, so he, he set up a camera in front of gamers while they were playing games because he really wanted to capture the emotional state. So you can see here, this is not someone who's relaxing, right? This is somebody who is working hard, but he has that sense of empowerment, like that he could do extraordinary things. He's really relishing that power. Here, she's not chilling out. She's engaged. She's working hard. She's working fiendishly hard, right? 
Very, very difficult, unnecessary obstacles that this guy is tackling, for sure. <laughs> now, sometimes we just get super blissed out by the work we're doing. And you, you guys have probably felt that if you play games, you kind of get in this state of flow, this sort of perfect match between your abilities and the demands of the game, right? So you can see here, she's going into that almost zen state of engagement. But this only happens when we're challenged, when we're working hard, right? Now, this face is interesting because it looks like he's maybe under negative stress. If you didn't know that he was playing a game, you would think that something maybe upsetting was transpiring here. But I've actually worked with scientists at UC Berkeley to uncover the hidden secrets of what's going on in this face. And this is actually the face of somebody who's optimistic, which we can tell by the crinkling of the eyes. We know he's focused and determined because of the way he's pursing his lips. The nostrils are flared, so that does show that he's a little bit worried. He's probably about to fail. One of the interesting things we've learned about gamers is they spend 80% of the time that they play games failing. So we, sometimes we think about, oh, we only play games because we want to feel good about ourselves and it's an easy win. It's actually the opposite is true. We spend 80% of the time failing in games. So I, when I look at this picture, I think he's probably about to fail. He's probably doing something very, very difficult. But there's always the possibility that he's actually on the verge of that epic win, right? That he's about to succeed and just shock himself with what he's capable of. So if this is kind of a before picture for an epic win, then I imagine that the after picture would look like this, right? This is the face of somebody who is just like, OMG, I am the best, right? So this is the face that I would like to see on people as we tackle real world problems. I mean, I know it's a crazy idea, but can you imagine, what if this was the face of people who were tackling problems like hunger and poverty and climate change? That's the big crazy idea that we're talking about. When I look at these faces, it reminds me of something that the dramatist Noel Coward once said, which is that work is more fun than fun. One of the great pieces of skeptical resistance that I run up against all the time when I tell people that I think we can make games that could change the world is that it won't be fun anymore if it has to do with reality. If it has to do with solving real problems, it will immediately cease to be fun because fun is somehow only achieved by escaping, right? Which is, first of all, we can know from our daily lives that we are perfectly capable of having fun in the real world. But also, I just want to point out that the heart of fun is not escape. The heart of fun is hard work, challenges that we feel able to fully engage with wholeheartedly and have some hope of actually being successful with. It's work, more fun than fun. Now, when we compare this to what happens in real life, when we are trying to solve these big problems, we get faces more that look like this, which I call the I'm not good at life face. This is a piece of graffiti in Berkeley where I was doing my graduate work that kind of got me thinking about this, thinking about the difference between how good we are in games and how good we are in real life. You know, when I talk about us being better in games, what I really mean is that we're unlocking a natural human ability, the ability to be optimistic, curious, ambitious, cooperative, resilient in the face of failure, less likely to give up, when we're struggling, more likely to learn from our mistakes, and most of all, able to picture that epic win, that incredibly positive outcome that keeps us motivated. That's, that's what we can feel so easily in game worlds. And then in real school and real work and at the doctor's office and in our neighborhoods where our neighbors aren't even nice to us, we feel more like this. We feel like we're not good at life. We don't have the collaborators we need. We don't have the goals that would really charge us up. So that brought me to my first fix in the book, right? So I said the book is structured around 14 fixes, 14 ways that we could take how games make us better and use it to change the real world. So the first fix I'm calling unnecessary obstacles. Compared to games, reality is too easy. I know that sounds very strange, but it's true. We play games because reality is not challenging us enough in the right ways. Games challenge us with voluntary obstacles that help us put our strengths to better use. Now there's something just in its own way incredibly positive about how we're using games to challenge us and put our strengths to better use, right? 
I'm not saying that we can't just play video games in the way we're playing them now. In fact, the book is full of scientific research that shows that if you are confident in a game, that you take that confidence with you for up to 24 hours. You're more likely to do better on a test at school, more likely to negotiate better at the workplace. You're even more likely to be confident flirting with strangers at a bar. So we can take these feelings that we're having in games, these feelings that we've been powered up to do whatever it is we want to do, and we can take that to the real world, right? Studies have shown that the social relationships we build in games translate to the real world. That if we help someone in an online game, we're more likely to say yes if they ask us for help in real life. So there are slippery boundaries that we're already starting to see. So there's some positive benefit to just tackling unnecessary obstacles that put our strengths to better use. But it goes further than that. Because what I've seen with gamers is that if we spend a lot of time putting our strengths to better use. And for the average young person in North America, they spend 10,000 hours playing computer and video games by the time they're 21, which is 24 hours less than they spend in the classroom if they have perfect attendance for all of middle school and high school. So they are spending a lot of time putting their strengths to use in these games. And what we're seeing is that they're developing these four gamer powers. And these are powers that I think you will agree with me are the essential skills and abilities we need for the next century to tackle planetary scale problems. So the first is urgent optimism. Urgent optimism is the feeling that there is some important mission that needs to be tackled right away and that I am the person with the exact right combination of skills and abilities to do the job. So I feel personally called upon to rise to the heroic occasion. This is something we feel all the time in games. And it helps us develop our radar. So we walk around a game world. There's an economist, Edward Castronova, who says that there's no unemployment in World of Warcraft. When you walk around that world, everywhere you turn, there's somebody waiting to give you a world-saving quest, right? So walking around with a sense of urgent optimism, somewhere, there is a job for me, and it's going to change the world. I just have to find it. Um, is an incredibly important power that if we brought to the real world could help connect people with world-changing work that they were actually qualified and prepared to do. Then we have the ability to weave a strong social fabric. So what we see when people play games together is that two important things happen. The first is that they trust each other more. Even if they're playing a game in which they're shooting at each other and it's violent and it's competitive and they're totally trying to kill the other guy, they still trust each other more at the end of the game because it turns out that it's a very intense cooperative experience. You have to agree to play the whole game. You're not going to quit even if you're losing. You're playing by the same rules. If you get through the whole game together, you trust the other player more. But what we're also seeing, particularly in cooperative games, even it might be competitive, you have a team of four against another team of four and you're working together with your team, or maybe it's just entirely cooperative, like Rock Band, is you start to get a sense for each other's strengths and weaknesses. And you start to have this kind of collaboration radar for what people are good at, for what motivates them. Okay? So after you play a game with somebody, you're more likely to understand that person's motivations and strengths. And just think if we could play games that would give us an insight into people's real-world strengths and real-world motivations so that we could have this real-world collaboration radar. Then we have blissful productivity, which we saw in the face of that girl and in the faces of gamers. Blissful productivity means that we will sit with a difficult challenge as long as we know that we're making progress. And the great thing about gamers is they know where to look for progress, right? That's one of the, the big innovations of gaming over the past decade, are all these different ways of tracking progress. There's levels, there's experience points, there's strengths that you can build, there's achievement badges that you can earn. And even if you're failing 80% of the time, you might still be increasing your experience points. You might still be getting credit for making an effort. This is not something we have a lot of in the real world. You know, I don't get this kind of positive feedback when I tackle some immense challenge. You know, I want to I want to stop climate change. Where are my experience points for the efforts that I'm making for that in daily life? When I turn out a light, it's one little gesture. For me, it's not making a difference in the world. But if I were getting positive feedback, if I were seeing the bigger picture of all my efforts, I could be blissfully productive. I could keep up with that task. I could keep that activity in my life. I could stay engaged 
endlessly for 22 hours a week. For 10 years, you know, some people have been playing their favorite games. And then finally, we have epic meaning. Epic meaning is the desire to be of service to something larger than yourself. And when I talk to people about games, sometimes this is the one that people have the hardest time really understanding because it seems like games are meaningless, that games are divorced from reality. How could we possibly be deriving meaning from them? So I just want to be really clear what I'm talking about here. Epic meaning, this desire to be of service to a larger cause, the fastest way to stimulate it is to provoke one of two emotions, awe or wonder. Okay? If you can get somebody to feel awe or wonder, it actually changes their physiology. One of the things it does is it triggers something called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is responsible for making us feel like we want to help others, to feel connected to people who are different than us, to feel like we're a part of larger humanity. There's great evolutionary science about this that shows how the vagus nerve evolved to help us cooperate and live in larger uh, collective scales. So when players are playing big, sprawling games, Halo is a great example, these immense worlds that have been built from scratch, and they talk about getting goosebumps, or getting chills, or getting choked up when they hear the music, they're provoking the same feelings that make us more likely to be part of a collective mission, which is why you see players of Halo spending so much time on online forums and wikis, undertaking collaborative efforts, I believe that's not an accident. They're one of the most intense online collaborative communities because the game is making them feel like they're a part of something bigger. And then they go out and make it bigger online. Now, I'm not saying it makes them more likely to volunteer at a soup kitchen yet, but we shouldn't underestimate the value of provoking these emotions, the same emotions that have been provoked for years by temples, sanctuaries, cathedrals, and great art. So when you add up these four gamer powers, you get what we call at the Institute for the Future super empowered, hopeful individuals, or SEHIs for short. <laughs> now, SEHIs are people who feel like they are personally capable of changing the world for the better, that they have one thing that they can do, one place that they can go, one partner they could join forces with that would help them make a meaningful difference. And they don't need to sit around and wait for the government to solve a problem or for somebody else to solve a problem. They're going to be active, and they're going to look for a way to make a difference. Now, right now, we mostly have games that are making players feel like super empowered, hopeful individuals in virtual worlds. And I think that is not the ultimate end game. That's not where we want to end up. It's, a very, it's not a terrible place to be because we are provoking all these positive emotions and building up these relationships. But we shouldn't stop here. It would be a terrible waste not to take these feelings of being super empowered and hopeful individuals and turn it into something real. So let's turn now to what that reality would look like. Okay? There are two big categories of real life things that we can achieve when we put our gamer powers to better use. The first thing we can do is we can achieve more ambitious personal goals. So this is what I mean when I talk about making us better. Right? What do we want out of life and how can we get it? How can we make our own lives better? There's some really easy to understand examples here. So Nike Plus is, is kind of the most basic example. Nike Plus is essentially a game. It turns running into a game. It gives you all this great game-like feedback. It tracks how fast you're running while you're running. It tracks how far you go, how often you run. And you even get little power-ups, just like getting a health pack in a video game. When you're running, if you feel really tired, you press the button for your power-up, and it plays your favorite song. So you feel totally fired up, and it gives you that kick, just like a health pack in a video game, right? And then there are all these other things. If you haven't been following Nike Plus, they've been making it more and more like a game since it launched. There's all kinds of online challenges. So for example, there was one called Men Versus Women, and all the male Nike Plus runners were competing against the female Nike Plus runners, and they were even comparing their power songs. So the women's top power songs, Work, Hollaback Girl, um, Guy's song is like the Rocky theme, that sort of thing. But this is an example of connecting runners also to something bigger than themselves, putting them in sort of collective meaning. And the statistics are really great. I've actually done some work with Nike, and they've been able to show that people who play this game do run farther, they do run faster, and they report feeling prouder of what they're accomplishing and feeling like their friends and family are more 
aware of what they're doing, more supportive of what they're doing, which is exactly what we would hope for from a good game. Foursquare is also a really well-known example. I think it's worth pointing out what it is exactly that Foursquare is trying to get you to do, right? Um, because there's a lot of interesting business stuff going around it now. They're monetizing it. They're getting sponsors to get you to go different places and spend money. But that wasn't the original purpose of Foursquare the game. So Foursquare, you know, you get achievement badges. The more you go out, if you go out five nights in a row or you see 10 of your friends in the same location at one time, you can, you can achieve different... Um, badges, you can become the mayor of a place if you go there a lot. But what is it that they're actually trying to get you to do? This is a great gamer t-shirt that I love, um, simulating the Xbox Live achievement system. Achievement unlocked, left the house. This is something I can really relate to, right? The Foursquare game is just about getting me off my couch and out in the world. I am more likely to stay home and work on a Friday night than I am to go out and see people. Sad, but true. And Foursquare is a game that if your goal is to have a life, this is the game that you should play. So I like to think about Foursquare in that way. And I'll just tell you a little bit about a game that I'm doing now for the New York Public Library. It's launching May 20th for the 100-year anniversary of the library. They wanted to make the library more engaging for young people. I don't know if you've noticed, but young people don't really go to libraries anymore. They go online, they really like Wikipedia. Um, and the library was like, what can we do to make this space feel more engaging? Um, and you know, we're talking about wanting to change the world. We can't just do things like give people points whenever they come to the library. We can't just give them achievement badges for checking out books. We should really be trying to connect to a personal goal that someone might have. So I thought to myself, what would make somebody come to the library? What if they had a book in the library? If I had a book in the New York Public Library, I'd go to that library, I'd feel at home there, I'd bring people there, I'd show them the book that I wrote. So we've actually created an eight-level game, which is modeled on the eight levels of the stacks at the library. The library actually has 40 miles of underground stacks that the public doesn't get to go in. We're inviting gamers to come into these stacks, and we are using 100 objects in the library to spark their own goals about the future. And then by playing this game, they will actually write a book. We're kicking it off with an eight-hour lock-in overnight, flashlights into the stacks, and nobody leaves until sunrise, and they better have written a book, and the book goes in the library. So this is a game designed to help young people achieve a goal that a lot of us have, writing a book, writing a book together. And we're hoping that this will actually help combine the feeling of being a superpowered, hopeful individual with achieving something meaningful. Okay, so it's not just personal goals that we can achieve by bringing our gameful spirit into real life. We could also tackle the world's most urgent challenges. And there are some great examples of this happening today. I think one of the best examples, because you can go online and play this tonight, and in just a few minutes really have a visceral feeling of what's going on, is a game called Fold It, created by researchers at the University of Washington. They had been working with supercomputers to try to come up with new ways to fold proteins. When proteins fold the wrong way in the human body, it causes diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's. In order to make medicines to fight these diseases, they need to learn more about how proteins fold. They can target medicines to the protein folding process. They thought maybe gamers would be better at this than supercomputers because gamers can sit with a hard problem and try a million different strategies. And even if the first 999,000 of them fail, if they start to see that they're making progress, they'll stick with it till they come up with the right one. And they'll be collaborative. They'll share what they're doing with each other so they can learn from each other's mistakes. So they set up a game where gamers could do that. The gamers played for about a year. And just this fall, the scientists published in Nature Journal, incredibly prestigious scientific journal, a peer-reviewed article that listed 57,000 gamers as co-authors. Well, that's a super cool achievement. <laughs> and the paper was about curing cancer. They haven't cured cancer yet, but they made progress. These gamers actually contributed to scientific knowledge. And there's great charts you can see online where they talk about this, where they show that virtually none of these gamers had any education in biochemistry. Some of them had taken a biology class in college, right? So that's pretty remarkable. And to get gamers involved in tackling a problem as significant as curing cancer. Some of the researchers have done a follow-up game, because I know probably a lot of you have heard of Fold It, but you might not have heard of their follow-up. It's called Eterna. 
The last three letters stand for RNA, and this is taking it to the next level. So they're gonna have gamers design RNA in a virtual environment. They're gonna test the RNA against different algorithms, and then they're gonna synthesize in a laboratory real versions of the RNA and test them in real life. RNA designed by players. So you can go online, play a game, and know that the RNA you designed in a virtual environment will become real and used in actual scientific work. Um, this is being done at Stanford. It's a pretty amazing connection to real world goals. This was a fantastic project in the UK. It was happening around the MP expenses scandal where it turned out that a lot of MPs were expensing thousands of dollars worth of duck ponds for their second homes, and it was very, uh, you know, crazy. And uh, the government dumped all of these documents with all the expense forms filled out by MPs over the past few years, but they'd redacted a bunch of it, and they, they'd photocopied them, it looked like, 10 or 12 times to make it really hard to read. They'd like put them at weird angles so you couldn't scan them properly and get the numbers out of them. So the Guardian newspaper decided to make a game to get people to investigate the scandal. You could investigate your own MP's expenses. You were have to, they needed people to basically crowdsource the transcription and the cross-checking and look for things that look suspicious. So this game, they had about 27,000 players process just under half a million documents, and were able to dig up all of these details over the course of the game that kept the scandal in the headlines, that kept the pressure on the politicians, and became part of the larger story where MPs resigned and new legislation was passed to prevent this kind of corruption in the future. So here are 27,000 gamers with no real voice in politics other than voting who suddenly became part of exposing corruption and changing the law. There's a great project that's running on a platform called Ground Crew, which is an SMS platform that gives you missions in real life, and it's inspired by Farmville. Now, Farmville, even if you're not playing Farmville, actually, you've probably been hounded on Facebook with requests from friends to play Farmville, so you know that you get asked to help your neighbors. Would you fertilize some of their plots, some of their crops? Would you feed their chickens? Well, what if, while you were walking down the street in real life, you got messages saying, hey, there's a community garden around the corner. Would you fertilize the crop? So this game will actually know where you are in your phone, and if there's a real garden nearby, it will ask you to help. Because what we know from these community gardens is that what they really need are people just to show up and get rid of the weeds and water it and keep it nice. And so you could actually, instead of just watering a bunch of virtual crops and helping fake you know, farms, you can actually help real farms in just a minute or two a day just in that moment when you can actually help. It's a pretty remarkable platform. So the last game I wanna show you is called Evoke. This is a game that I did for the World Bank Institute last year. The goal of the game was to teach young people, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, how to start their own social enterprises, how to start a small local business that would not only make money, but also tackle a social problem, like hunger, poverty, access to clean energy, access to clean water. Um, what we heard from the World Bank Institute is they were having a very hard time engaging young people in this challenge because they felt disempowered. They felt like there was nothing they could do. The problems in Africa were so large and looming so large. All they wanted to do was find any job they could. They were terrified about unemployment. They didn't see themselves as being real agents of change. So we needed to change that perception. We created a graphic novel set 10 years in the future. And the premise of this novel was that Africa was actually doing really well 10 years from now, but the rest of the world was really in bad shape. There was famine in Tokyo. There were floods and disease in London. There was total power outages in Rio. And it was the social entrepreneurs from Africa who had been tackling such enormous challenges with so much ingenuity and creativity because of the lack of resources there to solve the problems they were the people who had all the solutions. They had the experience, and the world called upon them. They basically were the superheroes of the future. So we use a story to get people thinking differently. The first thing that would happen if you enrolled in the game, which we called it a 10-week crash course in changing the world, we used SMS to advertise the game throughout sub-Saharan Africa. We used the tagline, free job training in the job of inventing the future. And the first thing you would do when you came online was you would start working on your origin story. So every superhero has an origin story. What 
took them from being an ordinary person to being somebody who was heroic and was doing amazing things. So you would talk about your secret identity, who you were before you started playing the game. You would talk about your motivation. You would talk about the local environment, who your adversaries were, who your dream allies were. At the end of the game, you completed 10 of these quests, and this actually turned into a multimedia CV for yourself of what your goals were, what your missions were, what your skills were, who your resources were. We didn't tell them they were doing that, but that's what they were doing. Then we had these missions that you could undertake, and these were real-world missions. So, for example, for the food security week, you had to go out and increase one person's food security. Now, that could mean anything. It could mean starting an urban garden. It could be helping somebody learn about sustainable agriculture near them. For the week on power shift, you had to transform something you personally owned and use every day to a more sustainable source of energy. You would report back with blog posts and videos. So we would collect all these blog posts, photos, and videos. And just to give you an example, here was somebody in Mexico who was playing the game who started an urban farm, and he's documenting his efforts. Here was somebody in South Africa who decided to set up a bike station to charge your iPods. He would ride around on his bike and charge up your, your iPod for you. After you uploaded this media, other players would give you positive feedback, the sort of leveling up of experience points. So you would get plus one collaboration, or plus one resourcefulness, or plus one courage. Over time, as you completed the quests and missions, you would have these runes lit up. If you create, uh, completed all of the missions and quests, the World Bank Institute would certify you as a social innovator, class of 2010. So there was actually a, a real learning accreditation that came out of the game. Now, we meant to be targeting, we were, our biggest push was for South Africa and then looking at the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, it turned out there are people all over the world now who feel like they need to know uh, how to start their own businesses <laughs> in this economic climate, who want to be involved in changing the world. So we wound up with getting um, just under 20,000 students when we originally aimed to enroll 1,000 from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we enrolled just under 20,000 from 130 countries, which was actually pretty tremendous. We had them um, work towards real-world businesses. The missions added up to a kind of business plan. For the players who completed all the business plan and their personal CV through the quest, we put them on global giving, and we raised money for their seed, uh, seed funding for their businesses. We matched them with mentors. So we had 51 businesses come out of this game, real-world businesses. Just to give you an example, my favorite one, it's called Libraries Across Africa. And this is meant to be like the McDonald's of libraries. It would be a profit-making franchise where you would set up a library and you would make it a free service to the community, but you would also sell services like Wi-Fi or cell phone access or snacks so that actually it would become profitable to set up a library. And they're actually working now on their first pilot of this in Gabon. So when you look at a game like that, maybe it starts to feel a little less crazy that a game designer could be nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, or a game like Fold It, or a game like Ground Crew. When I look at what we can do in the future with gamers, it's really about these four powers, the blissful productivity, the social fabric, the urgent optimism, and the epic meaning. I'm not saying that we need to spend all our time playing games, but I'm saying that we all need these four powers as we're trying to tackle the challenges of the next century, and that games are one of the best places that we can build them up. Those are words, but you can just remember these faces, too. <laughs> Hopefully, they leave an impression on you. And then I'll just leave you with this quote, which I think really sums up where we are with games. Bernard Suits, same guy who said that games are unnecessary obstacles. He said, games give us something to do when there is nothing to do. We thus call games pastimes and regard them as trifling fillers of the interstices of our lives. But they are much more important than that. They are clues to the future and their serious cultivation now is perhaps our only salvation. If you're interested in looking at games as clues and using them to figure out what we can do over the next decade to change the world, I've set up a secret headquarters online for world-changing gamers and game developers. It's called Gameful.org. We have about 1,500 very creative people there now trying to find games that are cultivating these powers to solve real problems and help people achieve their real life goals. I would invite you to join me there. And now I will entertain your questions. Thank you. Jane.
Jane, th thanks very much. Most people have been here before. You know how it works. Just raise your hand. There's a few of us in the audience. We'll bring you a mic. Tell us who you are. One question per person. Ken, there's a lady here in about the middle that has a question. Raise your hand, please. Keep it up. Um, Helen Wang from the University at Buffalo. Only one question? So, okay. Between engagement and sustainability. So, I guess um, I'll ask the sustainability. So, um, it's, it's really compelling to show these examples to people who are not familiar with games and thinking, you know, there's so much potential to games for changing the world. But how can you make the experience from just one time of you know, enjoyment to sustainable sort of infrastructure uh, for you know, long, longer lasting effects to, to take place? Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So it's a design question, right? What do you have to get people to do? Um, in the case of investigate your MP's expenses, that was something where they just needed a bunch of people to show up for a few weeks and do a lot of work together. And it could be kind of a one-off experience. So that was a very lightweight game. There wasn't much, there was no story, and the mechanics were very lightweight, they had a leaderboard, you know. Um, so there wasn't much game there. But then you start to think about a game like Evoke, where we needed people to play long enough that they could actually develop a business plan. So we needed them for 10 weeks not to leave the game. So we decided to draw on mythology and narrative. So there was a new episode of the graphic novel that updated once a week. And with that new episode, it would come with new missions and new quests. So it was sort of like um, an episodic experience, right? So we're developing future seasons of the game around more problems. The characters continue. The story continues. So you can look at things that traditional game franchises are doing with these ongoing mythologies to try and build larger engagement. I do think ultimately, for games that we want people to play for years, there will need to be more of um, an online immersive component. You know, there are a lot of people looking at tying real world behavior with 3D online worlds. You know, something closer to Nike Plus, where I have an avatar in Nike Plus, a little mini me, and I make her happy when I go out and run. So we're looking at ways to tie real world action with our avatars in games. And I think ultimately, if we're lucky, we will see you know, special dedicated World of Warcraft servers where it's for just for players who are also powering up in real life. Things that they're doing in the real world are affecting the game. So that we don't have a total separation of the entertainment from, from the good that could also come out of playing games. I think 10, 15 years from now, that's where we would hope to see the industry. Right at the back. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm uh, the co-CEO and founder of a company called Ripple. We actually use game design and have a bunch of game designers who work with us to help making work better, helping people work better together at work, in particular around coaching and feedback and recognition. So we work with lots of customers, and one of the challenges I find, especially as gamification becomes more popular, is they want us to toss like a lot of game crap at problems. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of games that suck, they're terrible games, even though they have levels and badges and all sorts of stuff in them. And it's because I think there's something unsatisfying about the underlying game. So we've been taking our time getting at it. And I guess my question for you is, how do you avoid sort of uh, the feeling of gimmicking or the feeling of sort of um, there's this thin veneer of fun on top of something that's inherently unfun yes. and designing for that experience where you're really getting at the core motivations? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm really glad you asked that. I mean, I had the opportunity to talk at the first gamification summit a couple weeks ago in San Francisco. If there, some of you may not be as familiar with the word gamification. I don't actually like this word. I don't use it. Um, but it's being used by some companies who want to connect with consumers in a more engaging way, get them to really be involved with stuff. They're going to gamify it with points and levels and leaderboards. Um, you know, my feeling about gamification is that it only works if the core activity is intrinsically motivating. So all the examples that I showed here, you know, you could say that I'm a runner, I'm now more motivated by the game. With Farmville, there's something, if you actually take the time to water somebody else's garden, that feels good, actually, because it's intrinsically valuable. You get that you're you're feeding people, you're taking care of people, right? So you're not trying to motivate people to do stuff 
that doesn't have intrinsic value. Gamification will never work, I don't think, unless we're gamifying things that matter. So um, are you provoking real positive emotions? Are you improving real social relationships? Are you giving people a chance to achieve something they would really feel pride in? Otherwise, you can motivate people for a while, but then it will run thin and feel like a gimmick. So it's all about finding something that's intrinsically satisfying and then just using game design to create a, a more accessible, engaging, inspiring experience. Right on the west side, Jennifer, you've got somebody. Hi, my name is Mark Lodi. I work in the digital, but more on the advertising side. I'm hoping that you can provide some insight into the altruism or the selflessness that you see a lot in the MMOGs that seems very specific to that genre, like above and beyond what people would do in normal uh, social context. Yeah, um, so there's so much great research about this. Um, it's not my primary of research, so I draw on, on other research that's been done. Um, and what I've looked at, a lot of research coming out of Stanford in particular, You'll see. is about helping people feel like they have a very specific role to play, that there's one skill or talent or ability to be there for other people that they have that then compels them to rise to the occasion. So if you know that you have a particular strength or ability, you're more likely to use it. And if other people ask for help, you're likely to put that particular strength into action. And actually, there's great science that shows the same thing for real life. If you know what your strengths are in real life, you're more likely to sort of look for opportunities to apply them. I think something that MMOs do really well is they help us identify with a particular way to be of service. And then when the opportunity arises, of course, we naturally take it because it's part of our identity. Um, that seems to be a part of it. I think also the scale of the worlds, the sort of sense of awe and wonder you have as the maps keep, you know, unlocking new territories and it gets bigger and there's all these people. And having that sense of awe and wonder is probably a part of it as well. Way, way at the back. Hi, thanks. Um, my name's Emma Westacott and I teach um, game studies and game design at OCADU here in Toronto. And I had a sort of specific question about... Um, sort of ongoing impacts of play. Um, I think one of the things that sort of capitalism and industrialization has given us is this sort of opposition of play and work. And I, I notice you talk a lot about work and in connection with sort of games. And I'm curious as to how you think play will gather enough significance to sort of, to disrupt the power structures of capitalism and capitalist society. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, there's a chapter in my book where I, I talk about um, the difference between intrinsic rewards, which we get a lot of from games, the sort of positive emotions and relationships and sense of accomplishment and meaning, and the things that we're told will make us happy. Things like getting more money, getting promotions at work, getting fame and fortune, right? Um, there's lots of research that shows that the only thing that actually improves well-being and, and, and genuine life happiness are pursuing the intrinsic rewards, spending our time and resources to improve and strengthen our relationships or to get better at something for its own sake, something that we enjoy getting better at it, or to provoke positive emotions. And that working for extrinsic rewards doesn't do anything for us at all. It can actually detract from our happiness. So there's something very subversive, I think, about gamers who decide to spend most of their time seeking out these intrinsic rewards and saying, okay, I'm not being productive. I'm not contributing to the GDP by playing these games, but I am producing a higher quality of life for myself. I'm sort of bypassing all of this, this, the things that we're told will make us happy, and just going straight to the happiness. There's something very subversive about that. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's worth looking at that as, uh, as a pretty serious disruption in terms of what we value, what the economics of how we spend our time. Um, gamers are showing that they value something different than, than we might be told that we should value. Hi, Michael Dila. Um, so I really buy <clears throat> the connection between voluntarism and, and obstacle. And I think in innovation, for example, successful innovation comes when we match intrinsic motivation and instrumental motivation, and that maps to what you're saying, I think. 
Designing work so that it fits that pattern, on the other hand, seems like a really challenging thing. And I wonder whether you know of or have seen or looked at yourself any evidence for um, the fact that work in highly innovative companies, for example, shows this, designs of the work and of how work is done that have you know, these, these balanced dynamics. So, so a kind of game design approach to the design of work because it seems to me that y you've looked at that in terms of challenges around social stuff and there's, there, there's uh, philosophical and other kinds of motives that people can bring to that. Yep. To daily work, designing daily work so that it can map off to those things is maybe a little more thorny. Yeah, okay, well I'll give you one example of a great company that's putting a little bit of this to practice and then I'll talk to you about some research, not about games, but about workplace innovation that I think ties back to games. Um, Zappos is a great successful company, right? Um, selling online shoes, they have thousands of employees and they created a game that every employee plays every day when they show up at work they turn on the computer. In order to log into the Zappos system, they have to play a game every day. It's very cool. Um, the game is the face game, and they're shown a picture of somebody else in the company. And they're asked, do they know this person's name, and do they know what they do in the company? What is that person's job? Thousands of people in the company, right? The goal of the game is to get people to understand who else is in the company, what they do, what they care about, to increase collaboration, to increase communication across departments, and it's like people who are siloed working on problems by themselves. So uh, I've been to Zappos, I've looked at this, I've, I've talked to their CEO, and the employees are fairly addicted to this game, right? It keeps track of how many you've gotten right in a row, you can look at maps of who are the most well-known people in the company, why does everybody know this person who does this thing? Um, and what they're trying to do is, is to promote this sense of knowing who people are, what they do, and that it could spur innovation within the company. And it's a very small thing to implement. You're basically taking a minute a day from everybody in your company to play this, um, and, and they feel like they've gotten really positive results from it. The other thing that I think is really interesting um, that I've been looking at is the application of time spaciousness to the workplace. Um, so it's kind of the opposite of time management. I just finished a report on this for the Institute for the Future, and it doesn't talk about games at all, but it ties very closely to the idea of volunteering for unnecessary obstacles. The theory of time spaciousness, instead of having your time managed and, and your employees know what they have to do every hour of the day, they're on a schedule, there's a certain amount of time, say one hour a day or three hours a week, where it's up to them to decide what to do in that time block when the time block comes around. They can't schedule meetings, they can't have appointments, they can't, there's, there's nothing, they can't answer an email during that period they must show up at that moment and look around and say, here's the thing that I think needs to be done right now. So, so they, have the t they have a space of time to do what they want. And it seems to me, it seems to be very successful when put into action. It improves uh, employee motivation tremendously. They feel in control of what they're doing. They look forward to that time period because they get to be in charge of where they're putting their efforts. And it seems to me very similar to tackling unnecessary obstacles, right? They're essentially volunteering during that time for what they want to be doing. So it seems like a, another way to just bring in, not changing the whole workplace, but finding a little part of time to bring that, that sense of voluntary obstacles in. At the back. Um, I guess I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, but what I want to ask is, how much awareness is there in the sort of established financial community and the investment community for uh, the development of game technologies and the funding of game technologies? Um, that's a good question, and there might be people better in the room to answer that. That's not something I, I would have expertise in. I'm not sure, as I understand, as you've asked the question. Is there, I, mean, I don't know if there's any more you want to say about that. Or just if anyone else in the room has any answer to that and wants to raise their hand, maybe you guys can connect. <laughs> you mentioned that you've worked on a couple of projects for companies. Yes. Uh, but they are mostly um, public sector companies. Is the public sector more interested in the, in the developments in that field than the uh, private sector? No, I'm more interested in the public sector usually. I mean, when I partner with um, more traditional clients, like co commercial clients like McDonald's, for example, um, it's because they have a scale 
of reach that I think is really interesting when you're trying to change the world. You want to have access to large markets and large infrastructure. So I do like to work with large companies that way. And, and McDonald's was a great example of an organization that said, we want to give games a shot. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell, there is tremendous interest from traditional um, sort of profit-seeking companies um, to do this. Um, a lot of the game designers right now are more interested in the social mission. So what I'm encouraging potential corporate clients to do is to find an intrinsic activity that they want to support alongside whatever their sales goals are, their branding goals are, because that's how you both get the gamers and the, and the game designers interested in working. Uh, Jane, do you think that uh, games such as Grand Theft Auto have a negative impact on society? And if so, what do you think can be done to encourage game writers to write more positive games? Yeah. Um, so I don't think Grand Theft Auto has had a negative impact on society. I'll say that. Do I think there's a spectrum of games that clearly have a positive impact versus have marginal positive impact? I would put Grand Theft Auto closer to marginal than some games, just based on research that I've seen, right? We do know that um, of all the research that's been done on whether games impact real life behaviors, the only kind of game that's been shown to change real world behavior appears to be um, games where you, where you race cars and drive, uh, drive in a crazy fashion. There does seem to be a very tiny, tiny, tiny impact on some gamers on driving recklessly. Um, violence has never been shown to be replicated as, as something that would happen in the real world as a real game. So I just mentioned that because, you know, it's, it's not all black and white. So, um, but at the same time, for people who like that game, it's still doing all of the positive things that games do, the unnecessary obstacles that they're tackling. Even though the content matter is, can be somewhat controversial, the structure of the gameplay still helps people unlock those positive emotions. So I don't really judge the content of games too much in that respect. Um, but I do look at structures like cooperative gameplay tends to provoke more uh, positive impacts than single player or competitive, right? Playing face to face in the same room with friends and family tends to provoke more positive impacts than playing alone by yourself, right? So we can start to look at that spectrum. And I do want game designers to think about those impacts. If I design a game, I should have some co-op because it does have special benefits, you know? I should design games that are fun to play with other people in the same space. That to me seems more important than the content question. We're on our last question. It's this lady in the middle. Stand up, please. Yeah, it's you. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's almost like a follow-up question. Can you bring the mic up to your mouth so oh. we can all hear you? Thanks. So, just one question. Okay, so it's almost like a follow-up question to what he just said. Um, I'm actually a graduate of a game design program in Toronto, so I'm wanting to get into the game industry. And the thing is, Games are still seen as pure entertainment. And a lot of people still like doing these entertaining things. They don't want to think about, oh, if I play this level, I'm thinking about you know, how terrorism affects the world. I just want to play the level. And, and so the, when you come down to the dev developer, it's like, OK, fine. You just want to wreak havoc across the level. We're not going to do any more than we have to. Yep. And how can we convince game developers that there's more to games than just Wrecking yes. havoc, shooting things. Yeah. So I see that we need two tracks of development in the future. And I'm not asking any game developer who's making games today who's perfectly happy with the positive impact they're having, which is real, right? There's real positive impact from traditional entertainment games. They can keep going along the track. The benefit of having companies still on that track is that innovation happens there more quickly. Because if your sole purpose, the only way to make profit, is to make players happier, to provide better engagement, to innovate new ways to cooperate at bigger scales, um, then you're going to innovate along that track much faster than people who are trying to do all of that and solve real problems. So I don't want all game companies to suddenly switch to making problem solving games because people who are making these real life games need that, that fuel, that innovation. So it's sort of the wellspring of ideas for, for other folks. Um, I do think there are many game designers who crave to do something that matters. 
you know, and it might only be one in a hundred game developers, but this growing sense that we want to have a legacy, that we want to leave a positive impact with our work that transcends beyond entertainment. And we're collecting them on Gamefall um, when we're trying to create that subsection of the industry that cares. You know, I'm really inspired by games like Fold It, where you had 57,000 gamers say, I want to work on a game that cures cancer, right? Now, that's not 13 million people playing World of Warcraft, but it's also not five weirdos who aren't like anybody else, you know? Um, and I think that we're in the infancy of trying to make these games, but when I talk to gamers, Many of them are parents who care about the world they're leaving to their kids. You know, many of them are teachers who are looking for ways to better engage their students. Um, I am optimistic that there are enough people out there who, want, who give a damn, essentially, that there will be room to innovate. Let me, um, on behalf of everybody, let me thank you uh, for, for doing this. I suspect this is a session uh, a lot of us will be thinking about for a long time. Uh, I certainly found it thought-provoking. Uh, let's all take a minute and, uh, and, and show Jane how much we appreciated uh, your time here today. And, uh, and behalf, on behalf of my colleagues at Rotman, we also want to thank uh, Penguin Books for helping make Jane's visit here uh, possible today. So thank you again, and have a good night, everybody.